Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. Maliki Yawmiddin. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. I declare that there is no deity, no other God, worthy of worship other than Allah, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final messenger of Allah. We have been looking in this series at the origin of scripture, uh, which is right, the, the Quran or the Bible, and so we're doing an in-depth look on each part of the Christian faith, and also we're going to also look at the Quran as well, to empower you to be able to answer people where the Bible comes from, who created it, who influenced the doctrines, as well as looking at the Quran and who influenced and who could have been part of, of the development of the Quran. So we've looked at the first part of the series, we looked at Constantine and the man who, who Constantine was, how he influenced the Christian faith and how he wanted to overlap uh, the pagan religion with modern Christianity that he was busy creating at the time. We saw how he changed the dates and the times to overlap with the festivals that the pagans were worshipping at that time. So today we're going to continue looking at the origins of Christianity, inshallah, and we're going to have a look at the sun gods. You know, Shakespeare said that a rose by any other name smells just as sweet. So we're going to have a look at the sun gods. Jesus, by any other name, may be or may look just as sweet. So when we look at the, the, the personality of Jesus, how many other Jesuses do we find that fit exactly the same profile as the Christians are trying to sell today or they're trying to promote today? So when we look at the, the sun gods or the S-U-N gods, we find that the S-O-N and the S-U-N gods have very similar traits. For example, there's Attis of Ephrygia. Now, Attis of Ephrygia was born on the 25th of December, and he was born to a virgin nonna. So Attis of Ephrygia. Attis of Ephrygia was born on the 25th of December to the virgin Nania. Now, he was considered a savior of his people, and he was slain for trying to save mankind. So the good that he did, he was slain and murdered for the sake of mankind. His body was symbolized by the eating of bread by his worshippers. So every time the, the worshippers of, of Attis came together, they would break bread and they'd give bread to each other in memory of this God that had come to earth to save them. He was both divine and he was also the son of God. So he was both divine. The people understood that followed the solar messiah of Attis. They believed that he was both a father and a son at the same time. So this was a concept that was around long before Jesus. There was also a day called the Black Friday or the Black Sabbath. And he was crucified on a tree during this time. And his body was uh, tortured and pierced. And the blood from his body ran down off the cross or down off this tree onto the ground and the blood was supposed to cleanse people from all the sins that they had committed. So he was in fact the Messiah that had been sent to the people to save them, and it was, blood was necessary to redeem humankind. Strangely enough, he was dead for three days, and after three days he was resurrected on the 25th of March. So now doesn't this sound very similar to somebody else that we know in history? But let's have a look at other um, sun gods that are around as well, long, predating Christianity by hundreds of years, some even thousands of years. The other uh, pagan god that was around at that time that was really well known is Dionysus. And Dionysus was also born on the 25th of December to a virgin. And Day of Remembering was uh, in December, like I said, on the 25th of December. And the holy child was placed in a manger where people came to visit him and adore him and praise him and worship him. Traveling teachers were quite common in that part of the world and as was common during the time of the prophet Isa, peace be upon him as well. Many people were claiming that they had the right answer. But Dionysus was a traveling teacher who performed miracles in all the different towns that he went to. So Dionysus was a traveling teacher who went around performing miracles in all the different villages and towns in, in the place where he lived. He rode in triumph, and in, in one part one of the records is given of how he rode in triumph on the back of a donkey into a city and how people threw palm leaves down as he entered into the city. When he was killed or murdered, he was eaten, and his Eucharist, or the Holy Communion as spoken about in, in the church, the, his Eucharist, or the, the bread, was shared amongst his followers as a form of purification, of coming closer to him. He also rose from the dead a few days later, on the 25th of March. So we find again another solar messiah who fits exactly the same profile 
as Jesus of the Bible does. He was God as, as a God in, in heaven and in, as he was a God on earth. And wine was used to celebrate as well the, the, the victory that he had. So people would drink wine and they would say, we do this in remembrance of Dionysus. And he also did many miracles like turning water into wine, just as we have the story in the Bible of Jesus turning water into wine, so Dionysus did the same thing. He was considered as the only begotten son of God. It's recorded in history, hundreds of years before Christianity came along, that Dionysus was the only begotten son of God, the savior, the redeemer, the alpha, and the omega. These are exactly the same words that we find inside the Bible. So he was a sun god, one of many sun gods that we find in, in history. Now what was very interesting is that if we go back to Constantine, Constantine had special coins printed, just like we have coins in our countries today. If you go to America, you have coins. If you go to Africa, you have coins. Almost every country in the world has some type of coin. And what we find on these coins is a symbol of the country. Maybe it'll be the crest of the country or shield of the country. It'll have something written about the country. Now, one of the things that people say that Constantine did is he had, he was one of the, the forerunners as far as printing emblems on the coin, either to depict himself or to depict his city or depict the religion of the day. And Constantine had on his coins that he continued to print all the time, he had a picture of himself and on the reverse side he said, in solo victus, in other words, in memory of the sun, in worship of the sun, printed on these coins. Now Christians will tell you that he converted to Christianity and that's why he changed the doctrines of the church because he had this dream, he had this vision from God, God told him to go and conquer in this sign, which he already discussed uh, in previous episodes that this sign was not a cross, it was either a fish or a sun with the sun rays. And now we know already that it could not have been the cross because that was only 300 years later that the cross was used for the first time. It wasn't likely to be the fish because that was something that the underground church was using. So it was more than likely the sign that he went and conquered other nations with was the sun sign, the sun rays. And like I said, many of the pictures that we see in the church, we see the picture of a saint or we see the picture, depiction of the prophet Isa, PSP upon him as the Christians use, and behind him are sun rays, almost like a halo with these lights coming out from behind him. If you look at any picture, you can go on the internet, you can look at pictures and books, you'll always see Christian depictions of any of the saints with the sun behind it. And this was by Constantine's clever, and, uh, clever workings to put the sun, the S-U-N and the S-O-N over each other and overlap them. So people would actually be worshipping the S-U-N, the sun. Now these coins that Constantine had, surely if he became a Christian and he had turned away from sun worship and he had changed the religion and his faith and found that Christian, the Christian God of the Bible was the right God to, to follow, surely he would have changed his coins and said, instead of the worship of the S-U-N to the worship of the S-O-N, but he never did that. So we can still find these coins today. We have architectural evidence where we can find these coins and see that these coins have not been altered in any way whatsoever. So there are some people that say that just before he died, he ordered his white garments to be put on himself and he asked to be baptized under the Christian God. Now, what was he going to be baptized under the Christian God for? Even if we give it to the Christians and say, fine, he did in fact get baptized. What was he baptized into? He was baptized into the Trinity which goes along with what his previous worship was before anyway, believing in three gods as one. So he would have been baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the S-U-N and the S-O-N and the Spirit. So he would have been baptized under the Trinity, which is what he was used to doing anyway in his previous religion. So he didn't really get baptized or have to change anything about his religion. He was still following exactly the same pagan worship that he had followed all the way along. Baptism, by the way, was nothing unique either to Christianity. Many of the other pagan gods required exactly the same thing. So baptism is not a, something that is unique to Christianity. But if we look at Christianity, we see that there are many Mary and Jesus figurines in pre-Christian pre uh, history as well. Now, please do not get me wrong. The Quran talks about the blessed mother of Jesus, the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, as being a woman who was chaste. And I believe without a doubt that, that Mary, the mother of, of Jesus, peace be upon her, and may, may the blessings of Allah be with her, that she was indeed a woman called aside. But then there are many in, stories in history where we see, for example, the Indian goddess um, having an in, infant god, or we see the um, Babylonian god with little child in arm, or the Roman god with little child 
or we see the Egyptian god with a little child in hand. They don't in no ways agree with what we say in the, in the Quran. You see, these, these women were chaste women, but they, no way are they specifically mentioned to be virgins. Okay? And also the way that Mary is, uh, conceives um, in the Bible, as opposed to the Quran, there's a different narration. The, it seems to be the same in many ways, but it is different. So there are many uh, historical figures throughout history where we see that there's a mother and child, mother and child. And when we think of Christianity, often we have these pictures of somebody holding a, a woman, holding a baby, or maybe looking up into the sky or whatever with this little baby. And these are figures that are almost identical. If you overlap the pictures that Christians have of Mary and, and Jesus, and you overlap the pictures of Egyptian gods and the Hindu gods, all of them together, and you see them overlapping each other, they almost look identical. The figurines almost look exactly the same. So again, the Christians didn't have to go very far to look for it. Now, Christians claim that the, the Bible is the Holy Bible. And I have in front of me here a Bible. And I'll just show you the cover. It says here, the Bible, or the Good News Bible. Some of them say the Holy Bible. But this one just says the Bible. And so the, the word Bible, where is this word derived from? So we're now going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to look at the biblical logistic origins of the Bible. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We are now looking at the Bible and the linguistic origins of the Bible. In other words, where does this word Bible come from? Now, in previous episodes, on the previous episode, I spoke a little bit about the Bible, but we didn't really go into deep uh, detail about where this word Bible comes from or where it was derived from. Now, Christians claim that the, the Bible is the Holy Bible. And I have in front of me here a Bible, and I'll just show you the cover. It says here, the Bible, or the Good News Bible. Some of them say the Holy Bible, but this one just says the Bible. And so the, the word Bible, where is this word derived from? It is derived from an Anglo-Latin phrase, which means Biblio, B-R-B-L-R-A, Biblia, or Biblio. And so this word is traced from the same words through medieval languages, like medieval Latin. It has, it's derived from many different sources, not just one source. And so the word uh, Biblio Sacra or Sacra means uh, Holy Bible. But we find that this word Holy Bible is derived from other root words, not actually from the text itself. You won't pick up the New Testament or the Old Testament and see it calling itself the Holy Bible or see it calling itself the Holy Bible. What you find is it's derived from Greek words, it's derived from Latin words, it's derived from Anglo-Latin phrases, but it hasn't really got its origins in any scripture or anything like that. What is also very interesting to note is that the expression the Bible is also used to describe many, many other books. It's not a book, a phrase that is used only to describe the Bible that Christians use today. Pre it predates Christianity by hundreds of years. It was used to describe many other manu manuscripts, many other writings. It, all it basically means is a collection of writings, holy writings. So. The uh, Hare Krishnas, for example, the Krishna Consciousness Movement, they have the Bhagavad Gita, or the way it is, they could call that the Holy Bible. The Hindu Vedas, they could also call that the Holy Bible. In fact, the Book of Mormon, which is another book I, I have here, which is a book written by the Mormon Church, is also the Holy Bible. And so the Anton Lefay's uh, Satanic Verses are also the Holy Bible. So any collection of holy writings, you can call the Holy Bible. So Bible is just a, a very vague word, which means a collection of writings or a collection of books. So it's nothing that is unique to Christianity. The Bible does not identify itself as the Word of God. So you won't find the Bible saying, this is the Word of God, because some people, some Christians especially, claim that the word Bible means Word of God. Well, it doesn't. The Bible, like I said before, it could mean the Word of God. You, it can be in that sense, but it's not strictly that sense. See, the Bible is not found in any of the books of the Bible saying, I am, this is who I am, listen, I am the Bible, here I am, or I am the Word of God. It doesn't identify itself. This is a label that was given later. Very similar to the word Hinduism. Now, Hinduism is derived from the Hindis Valley, a, a group of people who lived in the Hindis Valley. So, the Hindus should not really call themselves Hindus because it really doesn't describe them. They should be people who follow the Vedas, will probably be a, a better word. Uh, for example, Christians call themselves Christians, which is not a very good word, because Christian is a derogatory word. 
So the same thing with the Bible. Again, this is an imposed idea. And so it's a very clever way of, of distracting people from truth. And so when the people came up with a description of the text that they follow, they said, well, let's call it the Holy Bible. So it's not a word that, that was something that was uh, agreed upon or thought to be a good idea. This was something that was actually going to keep people away. So if we look at, at how successful was Constantine in corrupting and destroying the early copies of the Bible, the early writings of the, of the church, he was extremely successful. He managed to distract the truth and pervert this truth and twist the truth. You must remember that Constantine, who we've spoken about before, also decided what books would be in the Bible. So many of the books that were very, very interesting, were really good, that could have helped mankind, that were there to, to um, guide us on the straight path, that spoke about things that were going to be happening in the future, we were purposely left out. And we're going to look at how much percent of the original documents that were around at that time were included in the Bible and how much was thrown out and why they were thrown out. So let's have a look quickly at a short history of, say, the, 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 uh, the, the Bible itself. The stories evolved before the existence of Orthodox religion. So the stories that are included in the Bible, they, they evolved before Orthodox religion was put together. So before people could say, I'm a, a Christian or this is the, this is the group of, uh, of, of scholars that have put together this collection of writing, stories were already floating around. So they weren't always transcribed or written down immediately after the event took place. Many of the events took place 100, 3, 4, 5, even 1,000 years, and then only was it transcribed into a written text. So the stories were passed by word of mouth, by stories from village to village. Some of them got mixed up with legend. So they weren't recorded accurately at the time they took place. And there's no Christian scholar out there today that disagrees with this. In fact, if you get yourself any copy of a study Bible, um, in fact, if you don't want to purchase one, there's an easier way to do it. Just go to your public library and you can get a copy of the, of the Bible. Have a look at the study Bible and look at the introduction. It will say, it will have a, a basic writing by one of the Christian scholars or a group of Christian scholars. And they will tell you that these stories were, were passed word of mouth for hundreds of years before they were actually written down into a text form. And so these are a collection of writings of different teachings around at that time. Now, the common idea of the way the Bible was put together, if we give a short history of it, is that these manuscripts were found at different places, at different towns and different villages. Some of them were found all in one spot. Some of them were found in caves. Some of them were found buried under the ground. Some of them were found in people's homes. And all these, these texts were brought together. So let's just take a book randomly. Uh, let's start with the first book of Genesis. There wasn't just one copy of the book of Genesis. There were hundreds of copies. Sometimes, in some of the books, there were thousands of tens of thousands of these documents found and what they would the, the scholars would do is they'd look at what was common and they'd put what was common to all these texts together and that's what made up the book so many of the chapters and verses and and pieces that were actually belonging to the book of genesis are no longer included they were decided upon and said well these are not relevant so let's throw these out shouldn't we have the entire text the way it is so we can make up our own minds and, and see whether this is, should be followed or not but it was selected for us, so the decision was made for us. Now the Christians will argue, and they will say that these texts that were chosen for you are, are texts that are divinely inspired to be there. God preserved these texts. God preserved these words from any corruption, from any deceit. Okay, so let's, say, let's give that to the Christian and say, fine, the book of Genesis, the way you have it now, is exactly the way that God wanted it to be revealed to us. Then how come we have had so many, over 2,000 re-corrections or revised versions or changes in the book of Genesis? If it was revealed at that time to the scholars the way it was supposed to be, and it was the perfect word of God, how can it be changed 2,000 times? How come in certain books like the Revised Standard Version, they're going through version 17 of the Revised Standard Version? How many more Revised Standard Versions do you have to have? I have in front of me here on the table the, the Millennium Bible. Now, if I had to ask you a general question, and we're going to go through this again in future episodes, how many books are there in the Bible? And if there was an SMS facility, I would actually like to see how many people would send a short message to me on how many books there are in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations. There's a book over here, which is the first recognized official Bible. This is the King James Version. In the King James Version, if I open up the King James Version, it will tell me in the front index that there are in fact 66 books of the Bible. However, 
if I go to the millennium version of the Bible, the one that has just been released in, during the millennium, so that means in the last uh, eight to ten years it's been released. If I open it up, I find there are 82 books in this Bible. Now this is recognized by all the Christians throughout the world. It's got the stamp in front of it of the Bible Society, which means it's recognized scholars that, that approve this version of the Bible. But there are 82 books in that one and 66 in that one. So what is happening? Some of the chapters have been removed. Some of the verses have been removed. You will not find in this version of the Millennium Bible the, word, the, the sentence, Begotten Son of God. Why have they removed these verses? Because it is a work in progress. As we will study uh, further along in this uh, series, we'll, see that we'll have a look at what the Bible scholars say about the Bible actually being a work in progress. How can it be the Word of God if it's a work in progress? The Word of God is final. It is, is solid. It is written in stone. It cannot be moved. But if it is continuously evolving and continually being written, this means that man is now involved, and it cannot be an accurate historical document about what happened in history if it is continuously changing. You see, if we talk about the history of Adolf Hitler, we know exactly what happened. The history is written. It is done. It is complete. It cannot continuously be evolved, and people adding new stories all the time about who Adolf Hitler was and what he did back then. We know what he was and what he did back then. If we're continuously writing his history, then we are actually surmising or guessing, and we do not really know what happened. So as a historical document, we find that the Bible has some serious errors. So as we look at the many stories that are derived inside the Bible, we find that many of these stories actually come from Egyptian or Sumerian culture, that there is no original writings of the Old Testament available to us at this time. We cannot go back and look at any Old Testament writings and say, here's the original documentation because they no longer exist. Uh, God worship was uh, common in, 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 in the place and people in that time and in, in 2,000 years ago and before, and it had been mixed with all sorts of cult worship. So we don't really know what text is sacred anymore. And so as we come to an end of, the, of this episode, in the next future episodes, we are going to look, inshallah, we're going to start looking at the Old Testament, and we're going to look into detail in the Old Testament. So I hope this has shed a bit of light. We've, we've looked in two programs now. We've had a look at the, the different information about the Bible and the text, uh, the origins of Christianity, the origins of the Bible. And now we're going to have a look in future episodes, inshallah, at the Old Testament and see what information we can find out about that. So inshallah, I hope that you'll join me again as we investigate the origins of Scripture. Jazakallah and assalamu alaikum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.